Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this afternoon. Uh, thank you for um, taking your seats, those who have, and uh, for the rest of you. <laughs> we'll look forward to it. <laughs> this is the, um, the first afternoon, uh, first of two afternoon sessions, and uh, the topic is changing the system, advocacy and alliances for open knowledge. So this session's about uh, open knowledge in various, uh, in, in various guises. And uh, we, we have three speakers and they'll, they'll speak in succession and after they finished, after each of them has taken their 10 minutes, that is, uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. And that can range as widely as you like within the topic, which is uh, quite a broad one. And of course, a critical one for APO because uh, APO will uh, flourish best in an open information environment. And there are lots of, uh, lots of things that need to happen to create a much more uh, open information environment in Australia. And uh, our speakers are going to cover some of those kinds of things. So the two key questions for this session are um, uh, what, what kind of open knowledge, what do we want? And uh, advocacy, how are we going to get there? What kinds of things should we be arguing for? And just to briefly introduce myself, I'm the chairman of an organisation called the Australian Digital Alliance. We lobby on copyright and in particular, we lobby for the implementation of two wonderful reports which the government has uh, commissioned over the years. Uh, one, the report of the Australian Law Reform Commission and the other one, uh, this year, the report of the Productivity Commission to government. We support the implementation of those two reports and in general, we support an open um, flexible copyright regime uh, and just a quick plug for our annual forum 9th of February in Canberra keynote speaker Ruth Akeji uh, from uh, Harvard okay our first uh, speaker is Jimmy thanks All right. okay thanks thank you very much Derek um, okay I'm Ginny Barber, otherwise known as Virginia. I was once accused of hiding behind a, a sort of, a, of Ginny and Virginia not being the same, but if you don't, not sure who I am, I've got my orchid up there, which will probably give you a bit of a sense of where I'm going to go, because one of my favourite topics in the world currently is metadata, and I believe we should all have one. So if you haven't got an orchid in idea in this room, go and get one. Um, so I'm talking with my hat on as the uh, director of the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group, and I think I've, I know quite a few people in the room, but not everybody. Um, if your institution wants to be a member of this but isn't, please talk to me afterwards. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about some lessons that I think I've, I'm not sure if I've learned them, but lessons that I'm learning from trying to advocate for a system for change for open access within Australia. Now, you can tell I'm not Australian, and my background actually is in publishing, and before that I was an academic and a doctor. So I've been, but I've been in open access for quite a long time. I've been in Australia for two or three years, so four years, working in this job for two or three years. And what, what I'm trying to do is to uh, advocate for a sort of a system-wide change. And um, it's really hard, actually. Um, and a lot of the topics that came out at the end of the talk, at the end, the talks at the end of uh, this morning, really resonated with me. And I'm going to pick up on quite a few of those themes. I would also say this was a really hard talk to write. Um, it's not the type of thing I often do, um, and so I'm hoping that I'll get feedback from the audience about the, the things that I've, I'm going to put up there because I really would like to get advice from this group as well about our approach. Um, okay, so with that preamble, um, why are we in the situation we're in at the moment? So this is a great paper called The Oligop Oligopoly of Academic Publishing in the Digital Era. And, what it's, and if you're not absolutely terrified by this slide, you should be, as they say, if you're not terrified, you're not paying attention. Um, this basically shows that oh, since the 1970s, five publishers, and they're not all the same five publishers, have been buying up um, pub journals consistently. In some uh, areas of publishing, they own more than 70% of the literature. So I think that's pretty terrifying, actually. Um, and it leads to this kind of thing. So this is um, good old... Uh, Elsevier. Competing interest, I used to work for Elsevier, I worked for The Lancet, pretty much everyone in open access has worked for Elsevier at some point, so we're all in rehab at the moment. Um, and what they say in this lawsuit, which is against Sci-Hub, which I'll mention in a minute, um, they say that the Science Direct database, which is theirs, is home to almost one quarter of the world's peer-reviewed, full-text, scientific, technical and medical content. I find that absolutely terrifying. And that's what they're using in legal cases to block access to information. 
because this is what's happening, is that the system is so broken at the moment that people are doing illegal things. Everyone, has everyone here heard of SciHub? Ah, so SciHub is this fantastic, interesting organisation that, of course, I'm not going to tell you to go to because it's completely illegal, um, which is based somewhere out in Azerbaijan, I think, set up by a postdoc um, in her 20s who was furious that she couldn't get access to the papers that she needed to read and they didn't have any money. She set it up and she's now got about 40 million articles in it, somewhere between 40 and 60, we're not entirely sure. Probably most of it not inquired entirely legally. And when an analysis was done of her data set, it shows that, guess what, quite a lot of people who sit in uh, institutions around the world, including in Australian institutions, are accessing it on a regular basis. And currently she's being sued by quite a lot of publishers at the moment um, with varying degrees of success. So what do we want? What, why, and why is this kind of policy change really urgent? So this is what we want. It's actually really simple, I think. Uh, I used to have this as a longer sentence, but now I've sort of distilled it down to this. We want a fully connected, interoperable, open, global, scholarly ecosystem which shouldn't be so difficult in today's world. And actually, we want it about 15 years ago because that's when open access was first defined. But somehow or other, here we are 15 years later, and we've got this really, really massive problem, which is around 50 to 20 percent of, of the academic literature is as open access, fully open access, and I'll talk about what that really means. So most people, when they think about open access, think about something that's free to read, but actually it's much more than that. And the problem that I'm going to come to is that because we are thinking of something quite simple as being the solution, um, we're not actually developing the long-term uh, uh, initiatives that we need to, to move on. And I'll, sorry, i am not explained that very well, but what I mean is that there is a lot of um, different definitions with, about what open access is. There's a lot of diversity of models. We've got advocacy going in lots of different directions. We have huge problems, which is because a lot of this was driven from the STM side to start with. Um, and what happens in one jurisdiction doesn't work in another. And so we have this really messy system that, you know, 15 years after open access was defined, much longer after the internet first um, made this all possible, the early 1990s, we still have a system which is really poorly serving academics um, so what, what's the problem? Okay, what, what is needed is quite complicated, and I'm just going to run through this because it is kind of core to what I'm, what I'm talking about. Open access is free access, but it's not just free access to a PDF. Of course, most of us, when we read something, we do want to read the PDF still. That's how most people still access it. But it also has associated reuse rights, also has author attribution rights, and there's some sort of permanent archiving. And you can get to that in a number of different ways. You can do it via sort of traditional publishing models. You can also do it via repositories or other sort of semi-traditional models. Um, but right now, most of the time, we're still talking about free to access. And actually, there's even something we could do that's better than that, which would take us to uh, a much more sophisticated system, which I sort of talked about at the beginning. And that's one that's been called, that's called FAIR. Now, we're probably going to hear about FAIR in lots of different um, kind of... Uh, uh, I guess, incarnations this afternoon. This fair, but the FAIR that I'm talking about, it stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable and Reusable. It was originally applied to data, but now it's in, uh, applied increasingly to publications. And the reason that we don't have a system that currently serves us very well is most of the time we're not applying those principles. And just visually, this is kind of what it looks like. Free is free to read. Open is with the licenses and um, FAIR is this whole thing where you have much more complicated things that are part of it. Um, and right now, most of the literature is not open, and absolutely most of it is not fair. So we are a very, very long way away from serving, um, being able to do, what, uh, exploiting the literature in the way that we could. So, why, is it because we're not, there aren't enough initiatives going on? Well, no. There's a ton of um, information uh, initiatives going on globally. I'm not putting this up here for you to read, and I'm more than happy to share these slides afterwards. What is interesting is that we're beginning to see a coalition of um, organisations globally saying, we can't be doing this individually. So, for example, just I'll pull out only one of these, which is on the, the uh, fifth bullet point down, the Open Research Funders Group, which is a group funded, which is coordinated by Spark, um, which is a uh, publishing coalition within the US, is getting together all the big funders, the Gates Foundation and all those big philanthropic groups, and they are beginning to develop policies to, 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 to coalesce around. 
And this came into being last year, which was 14 years after we could have had open access and God knows how long after the internet arrived. It's taken a long time for people to go, actually, we've got to take a bit of control over this. So, but it's good that it's happening. There's also a lot of stuff happening regionally. So I, these are, both of these slides are really just stuff that's happened over the past year. In, the, in, in Australia, there's things like uh, consortiums around development of ORCID, which are the author identifiers, the same in New Zealand. The Productivity Commission has weighed into this in a couple of areas, both for intellectual property and for data. So there is beginning to be action happening here, but it's not happening on a consistent level and it's not happening uh, in a coordinated way. So the problem, I think, is that we have many drivers of change. We possibly have too many drivers of change. And I don't think that's helping necessarily with us getting moving in the right direction. So this is just a list of the ones that I have pulled out from this region, but there's, there's, there are you know, many more. And we've got this incredibly complicated system which has arrived. You know, so it includes data. We've got preprints, we've got the grey literature, the APO is probably the only organisation that is actually working in systematically. We've got books and monocraft publishing. Everybody is doing something slightly different. And I, I, I would imagine that if, you know, most of you this in this room probably are familiar with a few of these, but probably not familiar with all of them. Um, and I can also tell you that probably most of the, the, the organisations on this slide are not familiar with each other. So you can imagine there is this huge amount of sort of churn within the system that I think is, is leading to quite a lot of problems. The great thing is there's a real um, innovation ecosystem arising, but it's not being coordinated systematically. So what do I think we need? I think that we need to build the infrastructure to allow an ecosystem to evolve, which sounds, maybe that's, I'm sort of, maybe I'm trying to do driving evolution, which is not a terribly good concept from a biological point of view, but I think we actually have the opportunity now to build an ecosystem, build the infrastructure that will allow the ecosystem to evolve. And these are the types of things that we need to be putting within it. And actually, I was very struck by one of the uh, uh, quotes this morning that I'm going to put out. I, I can't remember who said it, so I apologise. The innovation needs a boring revolution. Who said that? Uh, yes, it's a great quote. Actually, I'm, I'm completely on... OK, well, I'm, I'm completely on the side of boring revolutions. It's sort of put it, we need to build, we need to make something which allows innovation to happen. And, and right now, we don't have a system that allows that to happen. And actually, it's not that complicated to build the innovation, to build the, the, innovate, the infrastructure. What will be complicated is if we try and um, drive the ecosystem in a way that, um, in, a way, in a sort of more um, systematic way. Oh, so I'm not putting that very well. Uh, two, two minutes, OK. What I mean is we, we, need to build an, we need to put things in place that allow uh, innovation to flourish. And right now, what we have is everybody trying to build their own little bits of um, infrastructure. And funnily enough, they're not all talking to each other. And we haven't put the really fundamental um, uh, uh, infrastructure in place, which is things like, does everything that you publish or that's on your institutional repository have a, a DOI? I can absolutely tell you it doesn't, okay, which se seems astonishing. Do we, does everyone in this room have, who's an, who publishes have an ORCID ID? Probably not. <laughs> a few people do. You know, if we don't have those types of things in place, we're not going to be able to really um, exploit the possibilities. Okay, so th this is almost my last slide. I think actually we need to do some fairly simple things to change the system. I think we need to have a very clear view of high-level needs. We need to build the infrastructure and, dare I say it, we need to fund it. <laughs> you know, this stuff does not happen by magic. In fact, if it does happen organically, it hap may happen really badly. And I think examples such as the ORCID Consortium, both in Australia and New Zealand, are incredibly important because they are, they are um, organisations at a national level getting together saying this is such important infrastructure that we will fund it. It's like building... You know, building the roads, you build the or building the, the trams or whatever, you put money into it to make the right infrastructure. And then you allow a diversity of a, a, the ecosystem to evolve around it. Um, and you put whatever incentives are needed to do that. And then I think we need some really clever supportive collaboration. I will just say one of the other things that I see happening quite a lot is competitive com collaboration, if that's a not not sort of oxymoron. People are trying to sort of build things, they, they don't want to take use something unless they've developed it themselves, and I see that as being incredibly damaging. 
Um, and that we are going to move from a system, hopefully, where we have this oligopoly to something that looks much more like an ecosystem. It's going to be messy, but it might actually be quite pretty. You know, we'll have a sort of the, the, the thousand flowers blooming. Um, but we do actually need to accept that we're going to change, we need to change the system quite fundamentally. Um, and then we need continual advocacy, which is why I'm going to do a little plug for my group, which is this. Um, we do advocate for this in Australia and New Zealand. Um, Amanda was one of our speakers at a webinar that we did this year, which was, which was very popular and uh, gave us a really great overview of the other thing that we need to do, which is not to think about open access or open science or open scholarship on its own just as something that belongs to universities. It has to sit within the bigger um, open space of which the grey literature that uh, APO is really important with um, ha has, has kind of really helped. So I'd like us to think about this as a sort of bigger picture, and I would really love to hear your thoughts on you know, how we move this along. Thank you. Am I in time? <laughs> Our next speaker is Robin Wright. Thank you, Derek. Um, I'm from Swinburne University, and I'm the manager of licensing acquisitions and copyright in the library at Swinburne. So Amanda asked me to talk a little bit about universities and advocating for open knowledge. But I thought about, I looked at the history and I realised, well, really we've been advocating for access to knowledge, not always open access, but more and more it is open, as of what Julie just spoke about, open access. But also we've just been involved in the broader policy discussion about universities and how we access and use knowledge within our own systems. So that's what I thought I'd talk a little bit about that and some other work I've been doing as well with open educational resources. So, um, so of course universities are both creators and users of copyright material. I'm a copyright lawyer so I come up against this issue of copyright all the time in the material that we're dealing with both in the university sector and in the open access environment. The universities sit on both sides of that. But of course, it is a very contested space, as we all know. Um, the product that we're dealing with can bring a lot of benefit to a lot of people by being shared and made openly available. And we're very aware of that. And we're creating this material. That's the reason we're creating it, to, to make it useful for the world. But also, it operates, as people have discussed, within a commercial structure based on restricting sharing. So we are constantly navigating our space between the two and as participants in the two. So the university sector has been very active in this space for a long time, often as subjects of court cases. Um, some of you may be aware of some of the court cases we've been involved with over time. Um, in the 1970s, the universities were involved with a case with the copyright agency called Morehouse about photocopiers in libraries a big deal because the first time reproduction technologies were widely available and the copyright owners saw universities as being in a position to infringe their copyright. So the Morehouse case was about whether universities were authorising students to copy the books that were held in their libraries and whether that was appropriate without proper recompense to the copyright owners. So the universities lost in that case and it was very um, clear that we had to be more um, careful and more of an advocate for the copyright owners and the ability for educating students about copyright law and fair dealing and how that worked and how they were able to copy limited amounts of material under fair dealing but not breach copyright of the copyright owners. And then later on, another case that came up against the, um, the universities, in this case it was more the school sector, was the 1982 case of Haynes or the memorandum case, which was a situation where after we'd first um, introduced a statutory educational licence, which I'll talk about a little bit in the Copyright Act, um, the government suggested to schools that there were situations where they didn't have to use the remunerated licence, i.e. pay copyright owners, they could use the unremunerated licence, i.e. fair dealing. And as it turned out, uh, the case made it very clear there was a difference between educational use by a university for educational purposes and research, research and study use by an individual student which was unremunerated. So again, we had to change our operating system to take that into account. 
So in the early 90s, there was um, the Australian copyright law introduced a, a statutory educational licence, and this was a lot due to the lobbying of the copyright agency for copyright owners. And under that statutory educational licence, the universities agreed to pay a certain amount to the copyright owners via Cal for photocopying material in um, course packs. And that's something that remains in place, although it has evolved over the years. Um, but it's quite difficult to explain to people the difference between the statutory educational licence, which is a remunerated exception in the Copyright Act, and fair dealing for research and study, and sometimes other purposes, which are unremunerated exceptions that can be used by any party. And so again, a lot of what universities are doing crosses over with this, within this exception space. We started to make this clear after 2000, um, the digital agenda reforms to the Copyright Act made a lot of changes to the way we operated. We, we were able to copy digitally under the statutory educational licences, although we had to develop new ways of um, surveying our use. Um, but we began to realise that it wasn't flexible enough. We were dealing with a lot of different types of material that didn't necessarily fall within the terms of the statutory licences. We argued for more flexibility. We started to argue for fair use, which is an exception that applies in America, but not in Australia. Um, it didn't work in 2005. There was not really any government response to whether or not we sh they should introduce fair use, and there was a lot of objection from copyright owners. So what they did was introduce what's called a flexible dealing exception, section 200AB, which is the bane of a lot of people's life because the wording was taken from international copyright treaties and really didn't fit well with what we were doing. But it did allow us in some very limited situations to have a slightly more flexible exception that fell outside of the terms of the statutory educational licence. So we've spent, that came in in 2006, so we've spent a lot of time dealing with that, um, that situation. But we still saw the need as the digital environment evolved, we saw the need for more flexibility in the way we used material than was encapsulated in our statutory licences. So um, someone talked earlier about the Australian Law Reform Commission review in 2003 into copyright and the digital economy. There was a lot of submissions made to that review and under that the universities actually called for repeal of the statutory licences. We said they had become too complicated, too complex, too difficult to deal with, too media and technology specific to operate effectively in the digital environment. This was looked at in great detail, obviously, by the copyright owners as well, because we pay a whole, uh, the education sector pays a lot of money to the copyright owners for the educational statutory licence. In the end, the ALC did not revend um, repeal of the statutory licences. They recommended, however, the introduction of a fair use exception. And that was really exciting because we felt that was a very positive recommendation. Um, however, they said if that was not possible, if that didn't fit with the uh, existing system, then they, we should have a fair dealing for educational purposes exception, which again would be an unremunerated exception which would sit beside the statutory licences. Um, as you know, neither of those recommendations have yet been implemented, but they remain in place. And then in 2016, the Productivity Commission also recommended, recommended the adopted of, adoption of fair use in the Australian copyright law. So we've been involved in a lot of this. We do a lot of submissions, we do a lot of speaking at conferences, and the university sector is very active in this area. But there's a long way to go yet. However, we were very excited. This year, there was finally some legislative change. I'm sure you're all aware of the Copyright Amendment Disability Access and Other Measures Act 2017. Yes, <laughs> copyright law actually gets amended occasionally. Very excited. <laughs> One of the really exciting things for us, and I read this on Christmas Eve a couple of years ago, when they, of course they put it out on the 23rd of December and I go home for my holidays with a thing this thick and I'm churning through this ex exposure draft for the change and I came upon the section that said, repeal parts 5A and parts 5B. <coughs> had palpitations, because that's the whole statutory educational licence. You know, wow, you know, this is our life and, you know, I thought I won't have a job after this, because we spend our life interpreting that section of the Act. But what it was going to be replaced with was a new, simpler, streamlined provision that had actually been, ad, um, been um, negotiated between the copyright owners and the university and school sectors together, you know, working together diplomatically, speaking about what we both needed and 
drafting something that the government agreed with. And that was really exciting. And so we now have a new simplified, streamlined educational statutory licence, section 113P, which replace, replaces about this much of the Act with two pages. Brilliant. We're very excited about it. It will come into effect on the 23rd of December of this year. And so we're busy madly changing all the terminology in our um, copyright information at the universities. In the short term, it probably won't have a lot of impact on the way we operate because it will depend on the agreements we have in place with the collecting societies and not, not a lot will change in the short term. But in the longer term, it's a much more flexible way of interpreting the type of educational use that we want to do at the universities. And so one of the um, parts of the clause that define how, what type of material we can use, which at the moment is, as I said, very media specific. We can use videos differently to broadcasts and there's a lot of complex technologically specific uh, information in the provisions. That's all gone. And one of the provisions that it puts in, it says that there is one of the um, elements that will come into how we decide what amount, what material can be used is the amount of the work copied or communicated does not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the owner of copyright, which is fantastic, very similar to fair use. It says we don't want to hurt the commercial interests of the copyright owners, but there are a lot of things we can do with material that would previously have been protected by copyright without necessarily doing that, without prejudicing their interests. It also introduces um, some clauses that used to be contained in the educational statutory licence, including one for fair dealing for access by persons with a disability, which again is fantastic because it get rid gets rid of the media specific and the disability specific provisions that we used to have. We used to have specific provisions that said we were allowed to do things in braille and we were allowed to do things in certain forms. Now they've just said basically anything that a person with a disability needs, any sort of technological format that they require it in, if we can buy it as institutions, we should buy it, we will. If we can't buy it, we can make a copy in that version ourselves, without breaching copyright, which is very sensible and great, and really also comes out of the Marrakesh Treaty. So we think that putting these together has worked really well. There's a focus on flexibility, and I think the government has realised that the new copyright environment actually includes a lot of sharing and the need for open licensing. So, um, as Ginny talked about, all of the Australian universities have established open access institutional repositories. We have one at Swinburne, and they provide material uh, access to research publications under what's called green open access. For those of you aware of the terminology, green open access basically means that a preprint version can be put up before it's published in the official version, uh, depending on the terms of the agreement with the publisher. Whereas the other form of open access, gold open access, which has been recommended by the UK in particular, is where you pay an article processing charge up front for a commercial publisher who will then make it openly available. Um, so we're operating in that ecosystem. It's changing a lot, as Ginny said, because of the commercial publishers moving into the open access space themselves. There are increasingly numbers of different def definitions of what is open access. It's different for every publisher but it's a very fast changing business environment and we're operating in it with, within it as well. You probably remember 2012, for universities it was the year of the MOOC. We all got MOOCs. Yeah. <laughs> Melbourne University got MOOCs, Swinburne we have quite a few MOOCs, massive open online courses. But then of course the definition of well, what is a massive open online course comes into play. Um, I personally was very interested in the difference between what is called an open educational resource and some of these MOOCs, which, as Ginny was saying, are often just released as open access material, material that you can see, but you can't necessarily access and reuse in any way. Um, the Paris Declaration on Open Educational Resources in 2012 defined open OERs as teaching, learning and research materials in any medium that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open licence that permits no cost access, use, adaptation and redistribution with others, by others with no or limited restrictions. So that 
the, you've heard that David Wiley's five R's, reu reuse, remix, redistribute, can't remember the others. Um, reuse of material is really important and we're quite interested in trying to develop open educational resources ourselves and to teach our academics about how to use open educational resources made by other people. And this is a really important and growing area. Seven, two minutes, okay, one slide. Um, seven Australian universities are members of OERU, um, a university consortium around the world that is trying to develop a completely open bachelor degree, openly available online. Um, and, and we're part of that, and seven Australian universities are part of that. Um, also, open online education is becoming more mainstream. I was very lucky to be able to attend UNESCO's Second World Congress on o OER in Ljubljana in September of this year, and they released the Ljubljana Action Plan, which is to try and encourage governments to mainstream openly licensed resources for use in um, particularly developing nations, and it's part of the United Nations sustain achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 4 for education. So I think the developed world also is going to play quite an important role in that, in the development of open educational resources. And it's great that it's an international movement. So I just wanted to make a, a short plug as well. Um, I've been involved in a joint research project between Swinburne University and the University of Tasmania to develop the Open Educational Licensing Toolkit, which is a toolkit we've put together, an online interactive device for educators in the Australian higher education sector to go in and step through a decision tree about how they want to either create or use open educational resources in their current job at a university in Australia. We give them information about the intellectual property uh, policy of that university, which is different in every university, and there is some change slowly between an exclusive all rights reserved attitude to copyright around teaching resources and a more open access with people applying particularly Creative Commons licences to their material. So um, we have the OEL toolkit up, up and working and we're very pleased and we're looking at rolling it out across all the Australian universities with the aim of encouraging academics to use more OER in the future. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. The third presenter in this session is Saksuma Kerika, the VP of the Australian Library of Information Association. Thank you very much, Derek. Thank you. Libraries, we are your friends. <laughs> Just going to put this up. Well, it's lovely to hear all the wonderful things that have been said about libraries today. And um, I must admit, I've been soaking up the collective IQ level in the room today. It's been great. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to speak briefly about libraries and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, you've heard them mentioned today. Derek suggested that I just give you a little bit of insight into how we're using those as a, um, a world policy, really, that we're trying to put into practice through libraries and through that build our advocacy platforms. So the first thing I'd like to do is, if it works, I'd like to show you a short video. I hope this works. However, if it doesn't work, <laughs> hang on, we'll just, we'll just give that one more go, because it is brilliant. No, it's not going to work, never mind. It's a lovely little video, and you can find it on projecteveryone.org, and it's actually been developed by Richard Curtis. In fact, I'll go back to the original there. Um, and it's a beautiful little video, it lasts about a minute, and it's supposed to be the United Nations, but with all these lovely characters of bears and, and llamas and things, celebrating the fact that the world has a plan. That for once the world has got together and we have a plan moving forward. And then there's a kind of funny bit at the end where the bear puts his hand on a porcupine and then the porcupine gets stuck to it. Anyway, so that was it, really. <laughs> All good. So the Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And when you look at those, you think, how does what we do relate to those goals? And for libraries, we could pretty much pick up any one of those and go, yes, that's what we do. Um, so things like quality education, um, gender equality, you know, STEM for kids, STEM for girls, all that sort of thing. So it was really a, this, this wonderful shopping basket of things we can do. Um, one of the things, so you've got these 17 goals. Underneath that sits about 160-something uh, targets. And underneath that sit whole range, hundreds of indicators. 
So, of course, it's hugely comprehensive and absolutely frightening for the government department that actually has to measure Australia's performance against that. Um, I find the, it's very useful to actually go into the indicators and have a look at what are the measurements that we're actually going to be measuring against. I particularly like item 16, and when I looked at the bit, because libraries are kind of in there around access to information, and there's one particular indicator, which is how many journalists have you imprisoned, tortured, or killed this year? So I think there are measures that you might pick up for Australia and measures which hopefully we might ignore. Anyway, so please do have a look at the goals. Um, how we got involved in this is that we have the International Federation of Library Associations in The Hague. We're part of that. The Hague, they went to New York. They negotiated hard because freedom of access to information, information is power, knowledge is power, what you guys do is incredibly valuable. And it wasn't really featuring in the goals. So our association, along with others, went to New York and negotiated to try and get freedom of access to information, another type of fair, freedom of access to information, into these goals. Um, what actually happened was we got into the targets, so we're the next level down. So if you look at the sustainable development goals, freedom of access to information actually sits within number five, gender equality, number nine, industry, innovation and infrastructure, number 11, sustainable cities and communities, number 16, along with the journalists, and number 17, partnerships for the goals. And what we see, the, the particular things we see, are that it's about IT, it's about cultural heritage, it's more about IT, and it's about public access to information. So for us, those are the things we're really focusing on. But having said that, how can you ignore the, the effects on health of having access to health information through health libraries? So we're kind of picking up a lot of these goals. And within the statements that the UN put out, they, they couldn't have put an intro on this which said, we envision a world with universal literacy. That underpinned everything, and that had libraries going, yes, that is us. So kind of, we, we saw originally that this was going to be a bonus for us. So back it comes from New York, back come the Sustainable Development Goals, and of course then it's up to libraries to decide how can we engage with our own government, with DFAT, who are leading this, and with the United Nations here locally. I would say that the Department for Foreign Affairs and Trade, the team on the Sustainable Development Goals, are wonderful, they are committed, they are pushing this really hard. And they're working with other departments to encourage those departments to pull together the data that's required to report Australia's performance against the SDGs. I wouldn't say it's something that our current government is really enthusiastic about, um, and sees as a fundamental thing to support. But of course we are signed up to them, so the government does need us to report against this. Australia has to make two voluntary national reports or voluntary national reviews over the life of these goals, which is 15 years, so 2015 to 2030. Um, the Prime Minister announced about a month ago, I think, or six weeks, that our first voluntary national review will be next July. So at the moment, everyone's scurrying around trying to put together the information that we need. And what interests me is that they are looking for the data, the statistics, the research that has happened in your organisations, but they're also looking for the stories. And where libraries are going is we are looking at for those vignettes, those little stories that can really bring this data to life. So we've got three conversation starters that we use with government. We say, firstly, libraries help deliver the targets. So what libraries do as a matter of course is public access to information. We do culture. And universal literacy is definitely our bag. So that's us in the first bit. The second bit is we can help you report for, against the SDGs. We have some data ourselves. We, we have statistics about attendance at story time, digital inclusion. Thank you to the team who do the Australian Digital Inclusion Index. Um, and, of course, we have culture and heritage, and humanities research platforms can generate some data. So we can help create these case studies. And the third thing, which we haven't explored fully yet, but, of course, we have got 1,500 public libraries across Australia. That's 1,500 shop windows for government to actually promote the Sustainable Development Goals. DFAT has got an office on London Circuit in Canberra. I don't know if anybody's been there recently. 
They've put the sustainable development goals outside on the window as a decal. And apparently they've had quite a few people go in thinking they were an early learning centre. <laughs> so, anyway. um, so what we're doing, government and other stakeholders. So what we've done with these so far, in March this year, we invited Professions Australia. So that was somebody from Engineers Australia, certainly somebody from the accountants, lots of people from medical associations. They all came to Alia House, the home of libraries. Um, and we had a meeting with uh, Sean Button from DFAT, who's the guy at the back, and also um, some other very um, important people. And it was great for libraries, actually, to be driving the conversation about a national and international agenda item. So in terms of PR for libraries, this was a really good thing for us to be doing. So that was a good thing. We've also joined um, an international advocacy program. So we were over in Singapore in June talking to colleagues from around the world about how we can implement the Sustainable Development Goals. And we're rolling that forward to the Gold Coast next year, the 29th of July, when we're having the Asia Pacific um, group coming along and we're running a summit on the Sustainable Development Goals and access to information. So um, we've got various ministerial sort of things happening around that. We've got uh, Christopher Woodthorpe, who's the United Nations man in Australia, coming to give our keynote. So we're liaising um, extensively around this. We've, of course, you've got this major national and international stuff, but how do you actually relate that to people on the ground? So what we did was we asked public libraries how the sustainable development goals relate to their library and information service or their council or organisation. And what we found was that half of the people we, we talked to, and it was over 400, said, oh, a bit, or, you know, not really sure. And half of them said, yeah, actually, we're really in that space. So what we need to do in order to meet some of the indicators is to move more government and other organisations into their support for the sustainable development goals. So we have put up three simple steps to doing this. Firstly, include the sustainable development goals in your library's strategic plan. It's easy enough. You just say, this is what we're doing. Oh, look, these relate to the sustainable development goals. All done. Um, and you can retrofit it. Um, step two, you can share that statement with your council executive, and the council can then put that into their own broader council agenda. So actually, it's really easy and simple to get the sustainable development goals onto the agenda. Now, I know that universities have been fantastic about doing this, and many universities have already adopted the sustainable development goals. But if they haven't, I would just suggest that the very easiest thing you can do is go back and look at your strategic plan and say, why don't we just put on a paragraph saying how this relates to that. So that's the sustainable development goals. I just wanted to say one other thing. Um, this is going to make any researcher, and certainly Julian Thomas, freak out when he sees this, probably. But um, this is an overlay of the Australian Digital Inclusion Index with the International Assessment of Adult Competencies. Now, the figures come from vastly different ways, and you cannot possibly overlay one on top of the other, because it's completely wrong in every kind of research thing you could possibly do. However, we are libraries, not researchers. So I did overlay this. And what strikes me is literacy underpins everything. Going back to the SDGs and a world of universal literacy, if you're not literate, you certainly won't be digitally literate, you certainly won't be sitting in this room. So help us with literacy. And please take one of these away with you. It's just 10 ways that libraries help uh, power smart cities. It's part of our agenda. Thank you. Uh, we've got a short time for some questions uh, or, or comments, um, and we've got two microphones. As soon as your hand goes up to ask a question, somebody will run towards you with a microphone. Is that right? <laughs> Any questions or uh, comments? And uh, we're focusing on those two questions. Uh, that is, what do we want to achieve to, uh, to, to make our uh, information environment more open? And the second, how, will we, how are we going to go about it? OK. First person. Can I ask Sue a question? You sure?
think the key was to actually getting everyone to buy into the SDGs? What's the, what's the trick? Well, at an international level, I've got no idea because I wasn't in New York, but I'm sure it was horribly difficult to negotiate. On a local level, I don't think anybody knows about them. Um, and unless we've got awareness, how can we possibly? But I must admit, um, as the mother of two teenage sons, as somebody said earlier, I'm rather relieved that the world has got a plan. It's rather frightening when you look at how it's, how it's going these days. So I think if we can just raise awareness, uh, whether we do that through libraries, universities, how we do it, that would be a good thing. OK. Uh, yeah, over here. Um, I've always been impressed by librarians' commitment to open knowledge. My question is, do you think in this uh, world of open knowledge that we're going to see more collaboration between archivists, records managers and librarians? Do you think the systems are going to become interoperable? Well, I'd love to take that actually. So, um, GLAM as we like to call it, uh, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, and glamour with the records on the end. Um, I think there's a lot more convergence. I think there's a lot of activities that we're doing together. Certainly we're talking to government about digital access to collections, and that's a, um, a conversation that we're having as a unit, as Glam Peak. Uh, we have started accrediting courses along with uh, the records and information managers, professionals of Australasia, and the Australian Society of Archivists. So we're certainly doing joint university course accreditations. But when it comes to the crunch, there are differences, and we have to respect those. So I think it's about working together where we can and respecting differences where they exist. Oh, yeah. Can I just say, in, in the broader copyright agenda as well, the government has taken into account the needs for preservation access and the, the changing needs for archives and the glam sector. And so there has been some changes to the uh, duration of copyright and the preservation provisions that will make it easier for archives to operate in the copyright six, in the digital system of copyright that we're developing. So yeah, I do. I think there's an opportunity for it all to converge. I think actually another top question, another um, theme that came out from this morning about information literacy and re really understanding what what's needed for that. So, you know, to be incredibly boring, I think what underpins all of this is a, is metadata, metadata infrastructure. Until we get a, a, pro a good understanding of that, not necessarily so everybody in the street has to know about it, but that it, it's fully understood at the level of the institution, the library, etc. Once that starts to happen, then I think all of this will converge. And I think it's beginning to, because actually you don't need that much metadata to make things all fully interoperable. You know, it's, it's not that complicated. It's just the implementation, just the implementation. Okay, we've got another question at the back. Thanks. Um, hi, Paul Box from CSIRO. Uh, I call myself a social architect these days. It's one of those made up job titles you hear about, new things that are, that are occurring. Um, the question is really one around, around infrastructure and what, what we mean by infrastructure and the, the kind of complex ecosystems that we're, we're dealing in. A lot of the challenges we've heard about in this session are really mirrored in any other domain, in, in agriculture, environmental systems. It's complex sets of collections of data um, and how do we make those interoperable. A lot of the challenges are, you know, their, their policy and behavioral interoperability as much as they are technical interoperability these days. So I guess it's, it's kind of a question and a bit of a, a call to arms around how can we start to build better interdisciplinary practice that bring together social scientists, informaticians, economists to understand these complex ecosystems. Because I, I think that's part of the solution. Actually, the way that we, we try to address this as a an interdisciplinary um, endeavor rather than people independently looking at it using their own <coughs> worldview. Okay, uh, quick comments from uh, our panel. If, well, my, my first, my, my immediate response to that is it's around incentivizing people to do the right thing. So, what wasn't talked about this morning quite very much, we talked a bit about researcher incentives. And I, you know, you've got to feel sorry for the researchers because they actually are trying to exist within a pretty complex and horrible system at the moment. I'm married to one, not the system, but you know. You know, <laughs> 
it's really hard to be a researcher nowadays when the only thing you get credit for is publishing in Cell Nature or Science or whatever. Um, we need to incentivize people to do the right thing and have the right behavior, but we also need to incentivize institutions so they're not, so they have a good uh, reason to do this as opposed to just trying to chase the biggest, the, the, the most recent league tables. So I, I think incentives at all levels would be my short answer. Yes, I just say that um, a broader um, overview by government should feed down into the university sector as well because that incentivization applies to academics as well. And we, we need a broader idea that openness is good, you know, that there, is a re there are some reasons in the digital environment for querying the exclusive rights commercial environment that we've operated in for so long. And, you know, it's, it's not undermining the whole system, it's just evolving and changing. And I think if that feeds down from government into the university sector, that would be of great value. I think there's two things I'd say. One is together we're stronger. So I think events like this where we can come together and talk about these issues and then um, go away feeling that we've got the support of our peers is really good. Um, the other thing I think which Robin mentioned was um, it's very tempting to have publishers on one side and, and content users on the other. But actually when you, when you do sit down and have the conversation, you find that you can achieve some sort of um, understanding and, and potentially move things forward, even if it's only by a couple of inches. So um, I'd say let's just keep talking. Okay, time for one more question or comment. Uh, have we got one? No, we might wrap it up. Oh, Amanda, yeah. Last word to Amanda. Um, I think it's, um, uh, I was just, uh, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, probably just a comment, but to think of um, what we, what everybody is doing when they're um, putting their material on something like APO uh, or any other sort of open system is uh, potentially supporting somebody in uh, South Africa to get access to research that they haven't, wouldn't otherwise be able to get access to and to bring it together. And we are really interested in how to, one of the reasons for sort of changing the name is to be able to um, bring together more resources from a wider range of areas. Um, so we've now got a Pacific research collection which is supported by um, uh, Auckland University and a group of universities in New Zealand. Um, so where we have these open infrastructures, how can we build on what we've already got? Um, and that's not necessarily just, you know, working um, on APO, but with APO to, to feed us in our content into some other system. So, you know, um, yeah, how, how we can, what, what we can think about what we can do for um, people all over the world, given it's a global system. Yeah, I mean, just one response to that, actually, and again, I think this is this does show the strength of, of you know initiatives like APO and individual institutional repositories. And every time there is a new, um, every time there's a new uh, initiative that arises, it strengthens what's there already. So I think sometimes we think we have to move the entire system at once, and that's the only thing that's going to matter. And then somebody this morning said, you know, the, don't let the the um, what was it the, the the good be the enemy of the uh, of the um, the perfect, the perfect be the enemy of the good, yeah. But actually, I also think that every time you build a new piece of infrastructure that works, that fills into, f f you know, it goes in, sorry, but I woke up at 3.30 this morning to get here. I'm from Brisbane, <laughs> so I'm slightly <laughs> sleep deprived. <laughs> Not usually this incoherent. Um, is it, it does more than just add itself uh, a, a, as a useful a resource. It builds on what's there already. So I guess this is, this is a bit of a call to arms for everyone. That every time you build your own system, feed it into the, the wider system, it strengthens it immeasurably. And it's, it's very, very important. I've seen that increasingly. And people, it, you can then stop being quite so discouraged about your thing being a small part of something. Okay, quick word from Robin and Sue about, um, Robin, about uh, how API plays such a great role. <laughs> <laughs> Well, can I just say more broadly that I was going to say I think there's a real, we, we really need to find ways to demonstrate the practical benefits of sharing, you know, to, to create a sharing economy and to show what practical benefits that brings to people who have only ever seen a way of operating in a commercial system in the past and the more examples we have of that, the better the whole system will develop.
And I'd just like to say what a wonderful job Amanda and the team do at APR. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> okay.